Okay, so we're, most of you have done the experiment on ohmic conductors where I asked you to graph the current against the voltage. Okay, so if you were to uh, change one of these quantities, so change the current, you would see and measure the voltage across the resistor, you would see a corresponding change in the voltage. And we saw that it followed a linear pattern. Okay, so if I have a whole series of points that I've plotted together from my data, they go up in a nice straight line, like a line that's fit, like that, you see that they're following a pattern. Okay, now from that we could make predictions. So if I were to say, uh, try and ask you, well, you didn't do a measurement for 3.5 milliamps of current. But if you did have a 3.5 milliamp current, what would be the associated voltage uh, for the 1K resistor? You could go, oh, okay, I'll we'll go along to 3.5 milliamps, trace it up and across, and that'd be my voltage in the, say, 3.5 volts. Okay, so you can make a prediction um, either for, if you, for a given current or voltage, that even if you didn't do a measurement for that because you could say, okay, well it's sort of, it's in my data, I'll interpolate between the two. Uh, likewise, you could make a prediction that would be outside of it. So if you only measured up to uh, nine volts, nine milliamps current, then if I ask you, what about for 12 volts? You could say, oh yeah, okay, probably likely to be 12 milliamps, okay, for the one K resistor. So that's an extrapolation, but it's still, this model holds for resistors, okay? So, uh, for a particular resistor, we saw that an increasing voltage gave rise to an increasing current, and the reverse also holds true. So if I gave an increasing current, so if I could somehow push more current through and measure the voltage across that resistor, I would see an increasing voltage. When we change the resistances, so if I swapped, swapped out from a 1K resistor to a 2.2K resistor, so a little bit more than twice, we saw, did we see an increase in the current or a decrease? It was a decrease, wasn't it? So more resistance meant less current for the same voltage. Okay, so if I had the same voltage, roughly, we saw a pattern somewhat like that. Okay, and so we got a different different line. So this was our 1K, this is our 2K2. So we saw that we have the same sort of pattern as an increasing voltage gave an increasing current in a straight linear fashion, but the graph was slightly different in that it was steeper. Okay? And from that we could sort of make a prediction, well, okay, what if I had a 4.7K resistor, it would be steeper still. A 10K resistor would be even steeper still. Okay? Indicating that for the same voltage, so if I just look at a particular voltage here, as I increase the resistance, the current gets smaller and smaller. Okay? So as you um, increase the voltage for a given resistor, you increase the current. So that would say that voltage is proportional to current. Okay? Now we use the symbol I for current. It comes from the old French word impetus. There's the people, the French researchers that were first sort of investigating electricity. Well, that's where it's stuck from. And we're stuck with it, and C was used for something else. So, we, so we're saying that V is proportional to I, which really means that V is equal to something, so I'm going to call X, in this case, times I. Actually, I'm not going to call that a constant. Um, a constant times I. So V is equal to something times I, and we can see that uh, the relationship between V and I changes for different resistors. So how much I increase the current changes depending on how much, uh, what the resistance is. Okay? And as you increase the resistance, the graph gets steeper. Okay? And so that means that the graph, the, the slope of that graph is equal to the constant. Okay? So uh, we'd say the resistance is equal to the slope, okay, which in this case is equal to our constant. Okay, 
Okay, so if I could rearrange that into a formula, V equals I times our constant. For our constant, it's the resistance. Okay, and so the first guy to work this out was George Simon Ohm, way, way, way back when, and so this is called Ohm's law. Okay, so the law means that it follows a, uh, a pattern that's set. Okay, but not all conductors follow this law. Um, and I think about three quarters of you are up to the, the non ohmic conductors one. Now we're using the oscilloscopes to, um, to graph our data, because it's another piece of equipment that can do graphs quite quickly and easily. We're exploiting the fact um, this Ohm's law though, okay? Because the oscilloscopes can't actually measure current. And if we want to plot current against the voltage, we need to do something. They can only measure voltage, so we need to convert that current to a proportion of voltage. And what do we know? If, uh, if I've got a resistor, then the voltage across it is proportional to the current through it. Okay, we just said that here. The voltage across that resistance is proportional to the current. So if I um, plot the voltage across the diode against the voltage across the resistor, then we see, I can say, okay, well, that's equivalent to the voltage across the diode against the current through the diode. Um, just a quick show of hands, who has actually finished the diodes one? Only a couple of you. So I'm going to give the game away a little bit with what to expect to see. For the non-ohmic conductors, if I plot the current, I'm actually going to plot the current on this axis, this one, and the voltage on this one because that's what you're seeing on your oscilloscopes. And what you'll see is that um, for a, a diode, as you increase the voltage across the diode, you get no current at all, okay? So we're getting a current along this way, okay? So let's just look at the positive voltage to begin with. So from here as I increase the voltage, I get no current flowing because it's not rising up this way. But then all of a sudden, you're going to see that it starts to conduct a current and it conducts, it starts to conduct a lot of current relatively rapidly for small changes in voltage. Okay? And so you see the graph stays basically zero and then starts to conduct and then basically becomes fully conductive. Uh, that's very typical of a diode or a semiconductor in that it will only conduct at a certain threshold voltage. Okay, and for a signal diode that's around about 0.6 or 0.7 volts. For an LED it's around about 1.6 to 2 volts. So it does vary a little bit. Um, the high power LEDs, so the high brightness ones that you see on your, the flash on your phone and things like that, they're around about 6 volts for their threshold voltage. Okay. Um, so this threshold voltage is determined a little bit by what type of diode you've got. But what you see, if you were to simplify this model, you could say, okay, below a certain voltage there's no conduction, and then above that voltage it, it's fully conductive. So if you were to redraw it with that model, it would basically just be a straight line until we got to the threshold voltage, a straight line up. Okay, so that's the uh, simplified model, but the reality is it does start to conduct a bit earlier um, than that. Okay, so that's for the positive side. So in the forward bias, we call that, um, it, we, won't, we don't get any conduction at all, so it doesn't conduct any electricity until we reach, effectively reach the threshold voltage, and then it can't con control the current, it can't limit that current at all, so it becomes fully conductive. If you, did have, if you didn't have anything else in series with that, so if you didn't have, if you just put your battery straight across the diode, you would actually uh, make it fail because, well, the wires that connect the battery to the diode and the leads in the diode and everything like that, they don't have zero resistance, they've just got extremely small resistance. And so, remembering Ohm's law, the voltage um, 
across something is proportional to the current through it. So, and divided by, uh, so times the resistance, but equals I times R. If R is very, very small, then I has to be very, very large in order to make the voltage uh, drop possible. We haven't quite got to the practical on, on series voltages yet, but basically the difference between this threshold voltage and the supply voltage is the voltage that would be across the, the small resistance in the wires. Okay, so um, if you had a 9 volt battery, then you're going to have about 8.3 volts just across a very small resistance. It means a very large current and it would likely damage the, uh, the, the, the diode. In the reverse bias, which is this way, so this basically means that we're applying a voltage in the opposite direction to how the diode would want to conduct, you notice that it just kept going flat. So here's our axis and we had no conduction at all, at all in this direction. Okay, so the signal diode and the LED would have exhibited this kind of behavior. So basically what this means is that it doesn't let any current flow backwards through the through the diode. So you can think of it as being a little bit like a one-way valve, but for electricity. So for an LED and a single diode, this is what you'll get. So an LED. And you know, there are other diodes as well that behave this way. So power diodes and things like that. Um, when you get to the Zener diode, there is one fundamental difference between the Zener diode and the LED and signal diode. The Zener diode actually looks like this. The Zener diode will conduct forward conduction at roughly the same sort of voltage as the signal diode, but then actually have this kind of behaviour as well. So it will conduct in the reverse bias after a certain voltage. Okay? And so this is the Zener voltage. The Zener breakdown. Okay? And so this is actually how the Zener diode is supposed to be used. You use them in reverse bias so that um, when the voltage exceeds a certain level, it will start to conduct. So you can use that to protect a circuit. So if I have a circuit that it absolutely cannot ever see more than 12 volts or something like or 5.5 volts across it because it'll fail if, it, uh, if I get a voltage spike or actually connect the wrong battery up or something like that, I can use a Xenovolt diode in place in front of the circuit there and the Zener will start to conduct when it sees that voltage above that Zener breakdown voltage. Okay? Um, Another way you can use it is that the voltage um, that the Zener, so if I have a circuit like this, uh, resistor and a Zener voltage, Zener diode there, okay, then this voltage here between the two will only ever be the Zener breakdown voltage, and that's very well set by the manufacturers. So I think most of you I gave a 3.3 volt Zena. So this voltage here, uh, the maximum voltage, so if I put 9 volts on there, or 12 volts, it wouldn't matter. That voltage there would only ever be 3.3 volts. Okay? Quite useful if you want something like a battery alarm, like for your, uh, where your battery, it, go, it makes a signal when your battery goes below a certain voltage. Okay? So if my battery goes below a certain voltage, I can use uh, this circuit in, um, and also something called a comparator, which you'll be learning about, to actually be able to make an LED or something turn on when you get a uh, low enough voltage. Um, okay, so in summary, resistors are what we call ohmic conductors in that the voltage is proportional to the current. If you look at it on a graph, it's a straight line, but diodes, and there are lots of other non-ohmic conductors, but the diode's a really good example, um, don't follow that rule, they don't follow Ohm's law, so therefore, the voltage is not proportional to the current um, in the conductor. Um, and if you look at a graph of a, a non-ohmic conductor, it is not a straight line. So in this case, it'd be like maybe an L shape. But there are lots of other types of shapes. So if you look at a light bulb or something like that, a 
light bulb follows a very different pattern. So I'll put the eye down here, the feet there. A light bulb might do that, or it might do that. Both of those, it's not a straight line, but it's not as extreme as the LED or the diodes. Um, so, but they're still non-omic, okay? And you can exploit that for some things. Uh, last year I had a guy who used a broken light bulb with the filament intact as a wind speed measurement tool, okay? Because you could actually, if you pushed a constant current through it, you could measure a change in the voltage based on how hot it got, okay? Um, all right, so if you have any questions about any of this, now's a really good time to ask. Um, I think that's done for the hearing.